So the first thing that I wanted to do is just give you a brief overview of what we do, who Isilon is, what we sell. Um, and then I just wanted to talk about how Isilon uses FreeBSD, the work we sponsored, and where we're going from here. So what does Isilon do? We produce a clustered network of storage appliance. Um, what this means is we have multiple servers that all act together to present a single file system image. It's a very unique, scalable architecture. When you, do, when you want to add to your file system, you just throw on a new node. If you need more performance, you just throw on a new node. In a lot of ways, we act like a traditional network attached storage box. Um, so in many ways, we should be a drop-in replacement for your NetApps of the world. Right now, uh, we can scale up to 96 nodes of 24 terabytes each for a total of 2.3 petabytes on a single file system. Our main selling points are ease of use and ease of scaling. Our user interfaces are meant to be very easy to use. Um, and you're meant to be able to add stuff very quickly. We have a fully clustered architecture. So unlike uh, certain other file systems, cluster file systems like Lustre, which tend to use uh, stupid things like a central metadata server, we have no single point of failure. Every node is an equal member of our cluster. Data protection is handled by the file system, much like ZFS does. We do RAID on a file level basis, and we have configurable levels of protection. So if you, you can set your file to, say, plus four to withstand four node or drive failures. Um, each node in the cluster as a whole is accessible by the NFS, SIFS, HTTP, FTP, et cetera. We try as much as possible to appear to be a single machine instead of a group of nodes. Again, this is why we can act as a drop-in replacement for your traditional mass box. So we have various things like load balancing and NFS failover requirements as well. Just to give you a little uh, sample of what our gear looks like, this is our, this is our Whopper. It's a uh, 96 node cluster, all one file system, all one namespace. This configuration is somewhere north of one petabyte. I don't remember exactly when this photo was taken. So how do we do it? We use a bunch of off-the-shelf hardware. We use multi-core Intel CPUs. We have 12 SATA disks in every storage node. We uh, use commodity motherboards. We have InfiniBank cards for our, our cluster interconnect. We use an NVRAM card for fast journaling, so it hits the NVRAM before it hits the disk. And um, on, our, on our new accelerators, we have 10 gig Chelsea cards. And that's about all the hardware we have. We have custom chassis, uh, you know, a small build for a drive controller, etc. But other than that, it's mainly commodity. On top of that, we layer a bunch of open source. We use FreeBSD with our own custom uh, one of us module. We use Samba right now for SIFS access. We use Apache for HTTP. We have a number of other packages on the cluster, but those are probably the heavy hitters. To us, our file system is our core competency. Um, if we could get away with doing nothing but file system work, we would, but unfortunately, there are plenty of deficiencies across the board in a number of the places above. So why did we go with FreeBSD? Well, I mean, the usual reason is the BSD licensing, and that's probably the largest reason for us. We can hide most of our IP down in the kernel module, um, but we do have some IP you know, running around in the kernel as well. The other thing is BSD has a tried and true track record. Um, it has relatively stable APIs, both on the kernel and user land. It doesn't go through as much churn as, as say, Linux. Um, it also has a very good network stack, which is pretty compelling. Right now, we're running a FreeBSD 6.1 box. Yes, we realize it's very old. Um, and yes, we'd like to fix that, because there are a number of improvements down the road that uh, we'd like to pick up. 
There's many modifications. Most of those are in the kernel. Um, we have modified some of the previous user space. On top of that, we have a, a ton of our own user space apps. Um, and then we have our own custom JFS module to actually handle our file system. So what we've changed, we have done various performance tweaks. Um, a lot of those get obviated by 7. Uh, and the ones that don't, we'll try to get back. We've done a number of changes to help SIFS support. So previously it was very much a POSIX file system base. And in order to have seamless SIFS integration in the file system, you need a little extra help. We've done various improvements for NFS. We had to add our own InfiniBand support. And we had to make various uh, controller improvements for the disk controllers. This is mainly to consume things like smart stats on the drives and to handle a few other things so that we can detect drive failures pretty quickly. Um, for SIF supports, probably the, the largest two things are alternate data stream support. So I don't know if any of you are familiar with the OpenAD interfaces, um, but it's the ability to you open a, a file as if it were a directory and then there are actually main streams under it. Um, And then the second one we should have submitted back long ago is actually support for NTFS actuals. Uh, we're now going to have to merge with FreeBSD support for NFS v4 actuals. Um, so we had that a while ago. Oh well. Uh, additional SIF support stuff we have to we had to add support for cluster coherent share mode blocks, cluster coherent op blocks. For those of you who are not familiar with op blocks. Um, Opplex are like NFS before delegations. Uh, they're essentially the right for the client to cache. Um, so we actually have internal support for Opplex right now, um, which means that once we get around to actually helping with NFS before, we should be able to help with getting server side delegations working. We had to add a create file interface of our own. Um, this is largely just a SIF semantics issue. SIFS needs an atomic way to grab an off lock and handle apples all at the same time. We've made various NFS improvements along the way, um, and I'll highlight a couple of the sponsored ones we did in just a little bit. Uh, but a couple of big ones before that, we made NFS exports changes. I'd like to figure out how to integrate these back as well. Um, Part of this was just transactional export changes so that you didn't always have to push the entire export list. You could just change one thing. Uh, and we made it more configurable than the original Etsy exports at the time. Um, we also had to edit file handle affinity support. This has been integrated, but we did it on our own code base first, and then uh, it got integrated as part of sponsored work. Um, this is the ability to associate any incoming NFS RPC with the NFSD that's already handling their file handle. Um, this actually had a pretty big performance win for us because it meant that multiple NFSDs were not trying to access the same file at the same time. We have our own Affinibend stack uh, with a Mellanox driver. In order to do that, we have about a four-year-old open fabric port. Um, Kip Macy integrated part of Open Fabric as part of the, the Toe and RDMA work for Chelsea. So we need to go figure out how to integrate that too. Uh, and we have our own port of STP, which is streaming protocol over in Um So I wanted to touch on briefly the work that we've sponsored in the BSD community recently. Um, so in a way, I'm stealing some thunder from Doug Rapson, who couldn't be here today. Doug did these two pieces, and uh, we're definitely open to, to further sponsorship opportunities, but we've been quite happy with his work. So we did we sponsored two large projects in NFS. Some of those were, uh, the first one was NFS blocking improvements. We essentially took RPC block D and rewrote it. Um, and the second one was RPC Safe GSS, which is ProRes and FSV3. Our general philosophy for sponsorship is that um, 
we're not going to approach we're not going to sponsor something that we need really quickly. Because if we need it really quickly, it needs to be done on our code base. We would rather sponsor something that gets done right and just pick it up later. Um, that's not to say that we haven't hired contractors to do quick hits on our code base before. But. So what do we do for NFS locking? <laughs> so I know many of you probably sit there thinking, uh, well, I thought you know, locking over NFS was just fundamentally broken. And a lot of people have this opinion. But it turns out that when everything is working just right, NFS locking works too. FreeBSD's <laughs> 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 um, yeah. RPC lock key was broken in just many fundamental ways. So any of you that was was trying to experiment with locking, that was locking against a FreeBSD server, that's probably where a lot of your pain came from. For a storage appliance, like we are, locking semantics over the protocols are actually very critical to us. Because we live in an environment where people try to take us and drop us in as, as, as home directory replacements. Um, and once you get dropped in as a home directory replacement, you have to deal with stupid apps that are expecting you to work as if you were a local file system. Which means that things like NFS locking have to be somewhat sane. Um, the old RPC lock D, these are the problems we swept under the cover, swept away when we uh, re implemented it. It had a very limited notion of asynchronous blocking. So the old RPC lock D would essentially try to acquire what it called a hardware lock. Um, it would try to acquire a lock on the underlying file system. And then if it could get that, the locking would sort of work after that. But if it couldn't get that, it would actually just say, eh. I can't give you the lock, I'm sorry. Which is pretty broken. Um, and if you can try to imagine our architecture, it's very broken for us. Because if someone accesses, tries to access a file on one node and then goes and accesses uh, lock D on another node, it will act like the underlying file system lock is locked from node to node. So for us, that was just kind of a deal breaker. It meant the contention across two nodes on the same file just didn't work at all. And this, this behavior of returning denied when you can't even get the lock is a complete violation of the protocol. Um, cancellation requests, so if, uh, if on the off chance RPC lock D could actually return the blocked message, um, the client is actually allowed to reply saying, hey, I, I don't need that anymore, you can ignore it. Those messages were flaky at best. I don't remember all the issues, but sometimes RPC lock key would just kind of drop it on the floor and they would end up getting the lock anyways, and yeah, it was kind of messy. Um, we've had numerous other quality issues. In fact, I'm dealing with another customer escalation you know, right as I left. There was another RPC lock key core. So we uh, hate to rewrite it. We sponsored Doug to fix it. Uh, Alfred helped coordinate these two. And for us, the right way was to move the entire service into the kernel. The main reason for this is that asynchronous event notification for lock availability is just really messy when you try to get that back out to user land. Um, you could do it. I mean, there are various hacks. You can use your traditional character device hacks or whatever to, to post events back to user land. But uh, we chose to go the other way and just say, OK, we're, we're going to try to make an asynchronous lock interface in the kernel. And then we're going to pay the price of trying to get an LM in the kernel. What this really meant was we needed ONC RPC in the kernel as well, because, well, if you have an LM in the kernel, you need Sun RPC to actually run that. Um, so now, in current, and I think it's in 7.1, and maybe it's in 6 something, um, FreeBSD now has an in kernel and LM service. We now have an internal ONC RPC server. Um, and there's a new asynchronous advisor lock interface. So we added a, there's a VOP ad block, and now there's a VOP ad block async. It's a VOP that takes a callback and will fire, or the, the file system should fire that callback when the lock becomes available. And Doug was actually kind enough to write a unit test along the way for it. So now there's a. <laughs>
Now there is a proper uh, F lock and F control unit test. So I'm, I'm quite happy with the work he did on the contract. So from our success on that contract, we had Doug go off and implement RPC Sec JSS for us. So for those of you unfamiliar, so Sun RPC has a, an extensible authentication authorization scheme, of which the normal um, auth flavor this is what's called auth sys or auth unix. And it it's not really authentication at all. It's essentially just the, R, the RPC contains a UAD and a pilot UAD. Um, RPC sec GSS is a new auth flavor, well, relatively new, uh, that adds this happy for authentication, of which Kerberos is the dominant just a safety eye mechanism, although others are possible. Um, Incidentally, RPC Sec GSS is, is a stack extent in front of us before. It's expected that before uh, servers and clients actually speak RPC Sec GSS. So we sponsored, with the success of the NLM project, we sponsored Doug to go off and build this for us um, and to do it the right way. How many of you have actually looked at the NFS server code? How many of you have seen the lovely hand rolled RPCs in it? <laughs> okay, so one of the requirements for us was to get rid of those. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the right way for us involved, there's now a user space daemon to do some heavy lifting. There's a new multi-threaded KRPC module, which is an extension of the, the module that we had previously. Um, and actually, I'm just flip to my slides. So Doug added a new GSS, a GSSD that, um, to do mainly the heavy lifting for GSS API. All of the, all of the real crypto is done in the, in the kernel using open crypto, um, but there's still a section that needs to be done for context creation and principal UID translation. So um, there's a new GSSD to handle this interface. GSSD actually uses the new kernel RPC mechanism to talk to the kernel as well. Um, uh, oh, the more part of that verbiage. The new, with the new in kernel, oh, the work he did for the NLM code made a, essentially a single threaded, fairly simplistic Sun RPC server in kernel. We had to extend that some more to make it applicable for NFS. So the new KRPC module is a, is a, multi-threadable um, RPC server module that also has support for uh, generic handling for thread affinity, so you can provide a, a function that essentially can pick, take a peek at the packet and figure out what thread to get it assigned to. Like I said, the NFS server actually knew, now uses machine generator RPC code, replacing all the hand-rolled stuff. Um, and the NFS threads now have support for file handle affinity. And Doug did some mild testing and, and saw the same performance gains that we saw with this on our own code base. Um, so what's the future for us in BSD? Well, we really need to do a 7x merge. Um, like I said, we're running on multi-core Intel CPUs right now. Uh, SMP support is obviously there in 6.1, but it uh, could be made a lot is made a lot faster in 7. Um, during this merge, one of our goals is to weed out our patch set and submit it back. Uh, my compatriot here, uh, Rachel, is is actually going to be doing a large chunk of that, and. Uh, after this, we're hoping to just try to stay more in step with FreeBSD so that we can get more advantage. We can provide stuff to the community more easily, and you can provide stuff to us more easily. Um, there are other things we're keeping an eye on for the future. We're trying to figure out our direction with NFS v4. Uh, many of you know that Rick Macklem has a, a patch stuff for NFS v4 rolling, running around. Um, we may or may not be interested in adopting that. We haven't figured out our story there. Um, 
we would, if we did, we definitely want to transition to the new KRPC modules. Uh, so yeah, we need, we definitely need to work on integrating with the new MSV4 Apple support at the same time. We also need to work on merging our new, or the work that Macy did for Open Fabric in with our existing Open Fabric infrastructure. Um, probably like the InfiniBand support that um, Kip mainly if out, things like that. <laughs> um, for those of you who, who asked about possibly contracting, um, most of our future sponsorship opportunities are some of the stuff I just talked about, like NFS V4. But after the merge, we're also going to be looking at uh, performance bottlenecks and we may be willing to sponsor work there. For example, we, um, we're running into VMM bottlenecks in 6.1, but uh, we won't really know until after the merge whether those bottlenecks really exist in 7. So we're kind of taking a wait and see approach before we pay anyone to go optimize our, our stack. And to some extent, we may actually be willing to pay people to help integrate some of our existing changes. Um, this kind of depends on, on whether we get enough manpower for the merge as well. Um, so that's mainly the story about Isilon and BSD. Uh, I just kind of wanted to leave you with our, one of our pretty pictures. And uh, just to say thanks, but you've definitely done a lot for us. We wouldn't really be here without uh, the FreeBSD community. And uh, I just opened up for questions. I guess they were shorter than I expected. So. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. um, just curious, if you have a uh, single master node and storage node with 12 SATA disks, what, uh, what if you could talk about some of the um, scaling problems that would lead you guys to 2.3 petabytes on these storage nodes? Is there anything that could be done to let you scale higher than that? To scale higher than 2.3 petabytes? Um, the main reason we advertise 96 nodes is actually that's what we've tested up to. Uh, we keep adding onto that. There are occasional other issues with, uh, a lot of our issues with larger numbers of nodes have to do with some flow control issues and a few other things. Like we've, we've had mild issues with nodes ganging up on each other. And, you know, if you imagine a 96 is node. Is it a flat network? Does every um, node have the same latency to the other nodes? Yes, it's InfiniBand's a mesh topology. So that's one of the reasons we're using InfiniBand on the back end. Um, is there another part of your The last part of my question would be, it's starting to look a lot like a, like a grid in a box, and so I'm wondering, what are the CPUs doing this whole time? Do you keep the multi-core Intel CPUs on each storage unit busy uh, recomputing uh, parity for the checks and so on, or are they idle as you scale to more and more cores on an Intel CPU? That's why they're leading in SETI at home. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, each of our, um, each of our storage nodes has a multi-core Intel CPU, and we also have accelerators that have those as well. Um, so we have two types of nodes. We have the storage ones that actually have the 12 disks, and then we have accelerators, which are essentially just fat cache and CPU things. Um, those CPUs don't generally sit idle. Um, we have plenty of bottlenecks. We have, uh, as you mentioned, we do calculate parity. So if you're doing, if you have a write intensive workload, some some amount of the CPU is spent doing writes. Um, now that we're multi-core, a lot of the CPU is spent waiting on locks, but <laughs> um, it's still enough that we're getting benefits from multiple cores. Uh, a good chunk of the cores is spent in the TCP stack. We have the Chelsea cards, which uh, do support tow, but we're, we haven't lit the tow part yet, so we do intend to try to integrate that. Thanks a lot. Any other questions? Uh, do you have any interest in PNFS support? We do have interest in PNFS. Um, and we have interest in a lot of the, the stuff that's in the NFS support on one spec as well. Um, PNFS is a little strange for our architecture. PNFS was written very much by the people who are different than us. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so they're, they're written by the the lusters of the world that have, or the lusters in the GPSs of the GPFSs of the world that have uh, a metadata server, data server architecture, 
So the, the PMS model is you talk to the metadata server and then it tells you, okay, talk to the, the data servers over these proprietary protocols. And that violates two principles for us. One is we strive not to have any proprietary protocols because we want admins not to have to install custom, uh, custom drivers. And the other part is, well, we don't have some central concept of a, a metadata server. We, we've talked about just kind of faking it and saying, okay, um, you can talk to any of our nodes, that's fine. And just essentially using PNF, that, that part of PNFS for load balancing, which was it, certainly feasible. <coughs> So have you contemplated giving the SIFS implementation back to previous uh, A good chunk. Most of our SIFS implementation itself is Samba. Uh, it's just we have essentially system libraries that provide a lot of assist, uh, heavy lifting for us. And yes, we've, we've contemplated it. A lot of it's a matter of just cleaning it up because some of it's very much uh, specific to kind of our patches to Samba as well. So with a lot of these things, um, one of the reasons we haven't given it back yet is just the effort it would take to make it ready for general consumption, if that makes sense. Um, if we had a full sub implementation of our own, we would happily give it back because it's something we would rather other people maintain. <laughs> um, my question is regarding your comment as to um, some people have a sample metadata server and you don't. And my question related to that is, what does your file system look like if a machine drops out? I mean, do you just, just part of the tree go black, or what's, what happens? So our, our metadata and our file data is all mirrored. Um, if you lose enough nodes in the cluster, you can have an availability issue. Of your, you can have a data loss issue. Uh, but in general, if you, say, do a read request, what will happen is it'll come in over one of the clients, or come into one of the nodes, and then that node will say, it, it'll look up your file in, we have an inode tree, it'll look up the file in an inode tree, and the, all the data for that, for the tree itself is, is well mirrored. And, you know, there are um, super blocks kept on all of the nodes, referencing where the top of all these structures it is, and things like that, and then, um, it'll go off and look at the, uh, it'll go off and find the inode, it'll go off and look at the meta tree. But essentially, yes, all of the metadata is mirrored, and all of the file data itself is parity protected in some fashion. And um, your metadata is guaranteed to be mirrored at the availability level that your file is at. So if you said, your file is of what we call plus two, which means it can withstand two node or drive failures. Um, then all of the metadata up for that file is guaranteed to be at at least three X, which means there's three mirrors. Um, so that's how we accomplish a lot of that. So the only way you're gonna lose data in that situation is if you lose more than two nodes or drives at the same time. Any other questions? <laughs>